Open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 27. Author John Piper says, The chief and ultimate aim of preaching, namely, to bring people to see and savor and show the glory of Christ and all that God is for us in Him, is an aim that cannot be accomplished by merely natural means. Piper says it is a miracle in the preacher, aiming to be an agent of God's miracle in the listeners, that human beings can see the glory of God in Christ. Since what we're about to do, Piper describes as a miracle, let's read this psalm with a sense of absolute dependence on the Holy Spirit to illuminate what our hearts and our minds on their own are unable to see, but what we must see for God to accomplish his intention this morning. Let's begin reading Psalm 27, verse 1. Of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident." One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now... My head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. (coughs) Wait for the Lord. Be strong, and let your heart take courage, and wait for the Lord. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. I love my dad. Uh, He's a hero personally and in the faith to me. He's a godly man, a godly father, and I have many memories of his godly character, but one that is vividly ingrained, one of those memories that stick with you even after other memories fade quickly, was a, a normal day where our family was together in the car driving on the highway. There was Uh, Nothing abnormal about it. To a point, there was no hint of danger. In front of us, there was an open truck, and in the truck was some kind of of furniture or packing or something. All I can really clearly remember is that uh, on one side of it, there was two mattresses kind of standing upright in this truck. And I remember uh, thinking uh, that they were vibrating somewhat violently in the breeze and the speed of the highway. Well, suddenly, one of them was caught by the wind and flew out of the truck and began hurtling down the highway toward us. Uh, All there was time to do was to recognize there was nothing that could be done. 
It was pouncing towards us down the highway. It seemed terrifying and dangerous. We were at high speed. It seemed certain that this was going to crash into us, hit the windshield, do some massive damage, or perhaps uh, affect a great accident. In that moment, when there was nothing we could do, my dad shouted. My dad doesn't shout. He's, he's more of a quiet man, but he shouted. And in my, my young ears, that just that memory of that shout uh, is just there to this day. He shouted one word, Jesus. And suddenly, miraculously, it had been moving directly towards us, and it somehow bounced away right as it was about to hit our car. Jesus. The, the sound of that shout reverberates still in my heart. And, and I think there's something that was revealed about my dad's heart, my dad's disposition in that moment. There wasn't time to do anything but to think about the most important thing, the one place that he went to for deliverance, for safety, when he was in danger, and all he could do was say one word, Jesus. I think that if there was a one-word summary of this psalm, that would be it. A desperate, a, a, a desperate a kind of acclaiming prayer. A prayer for deliverance, a prayer for help, a prayer that combines confidence and need all at the same time. That's what David is doing in Psalm 27. That's what he's trying to impart to us by his example. Here we have yet another psalm, which is a testimony that also functions as an exhortation to us. It's a testimony of David's experience and David's trust in the Lord, but it's also an exhortation to us. Where is our hope in the face of danger? Is our hope in the Lord? Is our hope focused on God's provision and protection and deliverance? Is our heart full of that same prayer when danger comes hurtling towards us down the highway of life? Is our heart there ready to declare, Jesus is my only hope. Lord, you must deliver me in the face of danger, real or imagined, possible or particular, is Jesus, Lord, deliver me, the shout of our hearts. Is our heart set on a hope in the Lord in the face of any danger? That's what David is revealing to us is the direction of his heart in Psalm 27. I think you can break this psalm down into three sections, two primary sections and then a conclusion. The first section reveals David's confidence in the Lord. That's verses 1 through 6. And then there's an abrupt transition, if you'll notice that, in verse 7, when he moves from a, a language and even an emotion of confidence to a, um, an emotion and a language of desperate need. So the, the first section I might label his confidence in the Lord. The second section, his need for the Lord. And finally, his anticipation of the Lord. The final two verses. Let's look at the first section, his confidence in the Lord. David launches right into this psalm with declarations of confidence. The Lord is my light and my salvation. That one line could nourish Christians through almost any kind of difficulty in life. The Lord, the covenant God, is my, notice the personal nature of this, he's not just a God for people somewhere, he is my light, which means there is no darkness that can consume or cover me, and my salvation, which means he delivers me from trouble. And the result of that declaration of confidence is that David asks the rhetorical question, whom shall I fear? The answer is no one. If the Lord is my light, then what darkness can consume me? No, no darkness. If the Lord is my salvation, then what enemy could overcome me? No one. He continues in typical Hebrew poetry uh, with a parallel. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Therefore, of whom shall I be afraid? Again, the answer, no one. Verse one here is a strong expression of confidence using these three metaphors. The Lord is my light in darkness. He is my, my salvation in danger. He is my refuge in attack. And in light of that, I have nothing to fear. 
Objectively, David would say, objectively, there is no danger that can darken, threaten, or assault a person who is found within the enlightened protection of God. There is nothing to fear. And he goes from that broad statement of confidence to a very shocking example. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, this is a graphic image. David pictures himself like a sheep wandering in the hillside with wolves coming to devour him. David saw other people in his life as having every amount of of ferocity and appetite to chew up his life and to eat him up. That's how he saw his enemies. And yet, he says, it is they who stumble and fall. David's confidence is, and I I think there's actually a a point here about uh, who actually gets injured when God's people are attacked by evildoers, who actually ultimately falls or is devoured. Well, it's those who do the attacking. We see this all the time in the book of Acts. Those who seek to devour God's people are themselves finally devoured. In that very act, they are destroying themselves. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. So he goes from being this this lonely sheep in the wilderness surrounded by wolves, confident that it is the wolves themselves who are actually in danger. Then he says, though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. You notice the the expressions of confidence here. Why won't his heart be afraid even when an army, imagine this, and David literally had this happen to him. He is there in the cave and an army of enemies is around with spears and swords to run him through. But he says, my heart will not be afraid. It would not be afraid, even if an army were to camp against me, even if war to arise against me, yet I will be confident, he says. You notice why I say that the first section of this psalm might be labeled his confidence in the Lord. According to David, God is worthy of ultimate, infinite confidence. There is no dangerous situation that David could describe uh, more profound than having evildoers like wolves seeking to eat him up or an army encamps against him. He says, look, even in the absolute worst case scenario, the Lord will give me absolute security in his goodness towards me such that I need not fear. So certain is David that God is his protection, that being near God is all he really wants or needs. Notice verse 4, one thing have I asked of the Lord. Notice it's not so much a particular answer to a particular question that is first on David's mind. It is first being near to God, because as long as he's near to God, he will surely, verse 5, have protection in God's shelter. Notice this, one thing have I asked of the Lord. That will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now that that one thing that he's asking, it's not categorical. David's going to go on in this psalm to ask some very specific questions of God. But it's saying, look, compared to being near God, it's as though anything else I need is irrelevant. Compared to being near God, any other danger, any other specific request is irrelevant because if I'm near to God, if I'm gazing at his beauty, if I'm allowed to be close to his presence, that's the only ultimate shelter that I need. For, he says, why do I want to be near God? Notice the word for in verse 5. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. David views the tabernacle of God, the old tabernacle that the Jewish people had, almost like a a castle of protection. He's saying, look, to be close to God is to be in a place of of absolute refuge and protection. I'm as safe as if I were in a, a castle on the side of a mountain. There is nothing that can get me here when I am close to God. And now he says... My head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Remarkable. 
It's a remarkable thing. He's saying, look, look, though an army encamp against me, though I have wolves seeking to tear me to pieces, actually what's going to happen is that my, my, my head will be lifted up in victory. In, in the old days, when a, when a king was defeated, one of the ways they symbolized the victory is the conquering army, the conquering captain, would place his foot on the neck of that king. It was, it was a way of declaring, you are completely under our power. Well, David says, that is not going to be my experience. Actually, my head, far from being crushed under the foot of my enemies, my head's going to be lifted up in glory, in victory. And the result of this, I will actually be offering in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. What does verse 1 through 6 tell us? It says that David believes that God is worthy of the most impossible expressions of confidence. It is a hope that goes beyond any natural expectations, any human reason. It is a faith that expands beyond any limitations of material provision or personality or character. It is a faith that expands to include all of the power of God at work for the good of this man who seeks God and God alone. It's an expression of confidence in God's protection, a desire towards his presence, and an assurance that his praise will ultimately be the result of any difficulty David finds himself in. It's remarkable. Now, here's, here's I think we can apply this to us. David is going to move to a place of request and acknowledging his need in the Lord. And that is very comforting. We're going to move to verse 7. But I think there is a type of Christian, not, not everywhere, and maybe not totally common, but there are some Christians that almost all of their interactions with the Lord are based on asking God for help, and, and they don't often declare their confidence in God's ability to help. Uh, you could just evaluate maybe even your own prayers. Often it's the case. We can think about our, our request that God would help us. Lord, help me with this situation. Lord, I need your help. I need your help. Please help me with my child. Please help me with my marriage. Please help me with my job. Please help me with this bill I need to pay. Please, please help. And, and that's good. And David's going to get to that. But let me ask this question. Does your prayer life often declare to the Lord your confidence that he is able? He is able and powerful and willing to deliver you. This can happen when we face the danger of temptation. This can happen when we're called to do something in service to God and we're aware of, we're aware of dangers and difficulties in that situation. This can happen with financial difficulties. Anytime we could identify somewhat with David and say, I feel like there's enemies that surround me. I'm in great danger. Do your prayers declare the Lord is my light and my salvation. It's good to declare to the Lord our confidence in him. Will we move towards a place of need and dependence? Yes, we will. But it's good to declare our hope and our assurance in him. To say out loud, Lord, in light of, you, of who you are, even if the worst thing were to befall me, I have confidence in your loving kindness directed towards me. You're like a castle of refuge for me. Sometimes Christians spend their lives worried about a worst-case scenario and unsure of what would happen if that took place. Basically, I remember talking to, to one uh, dear, dear Christian who was saying, look, I, I feel like I live life, and I'm just hoping that the worst doesn't happen. I, I just live with a kind of a, a worst-case scenario avoidance syndrome. I'm, I'm just hoping that doesn't happen. I can deal with the regular things, but that I couldn't deal with. And, and I find a lot of Christians have a that that they couldn't deal with in their mind, even ahead of time, even if it's never happened, it's in the back of their mind. And even the hint of those things send them, sends them into a panic. Uh, for some people, it's, it's losing a spouse, uh, losing a child, losing a job, financial insecurity. It, it's that thing, that, it's that worst case scenario thing that I can't imagine dealing with. And much of life, even when it doesn't happen, is spent wondering if it's around the corner. 
Look, what David does is he walks metaphorically around the corner. He visualizes that worst case scenario and he declares to it, the Lord is my light and my salvation. That, that's a better way to live in hope towards the Lord, isn't it? Isn't that a better way for a mom to live who lives in an ongoing low-grade fear that her children might not follow the Lord even in their, their early years? To walk around the corner and to stare that possibility in the face and to say, look, even in that great, painful, and deadly situation, I declare the Lord is my light and my salvation, and it is good for me to be near my God, for he will be my shelter. What if I were to be, to be ridiculed as a Christian? To walk around the corner of that metaphorical situation and declare, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I will not fear, for God is with me. Look, if, if some corner of your soul holds on to a, I don't know what would happen if this particular danger took place, let me urge you and encourage you. Declare with David, the Lord is my confidence. The Lord is my confidence. We need confident declarations of the Lord. Are you imperfect? Yes. Is there some part of your heart that doubts? Of course there is. Like David, he had moments where he doubted. He wasn't sure. He needed God to help him and correct him. We're not declaring that our confidence is perfect. We're declaring that the object of our confidence is perfect. Confidence in the Lord reveals our hope in him. But thankfully, David doesn't stop at verse 6. And that is good news for anyone who has wondered whether the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel and the faith movement seems to not jive with your everyday experience. That teaching that says we should live life in a perpetual state of confident emotional declaration of what God is able to do. Not according to David. David is able to move quickly from confidence to desperate need and vulnerability. Do you notice that? Do you notice in verse 7, Dave just moves from confident declarations to a prayer where David feels overwhelmingly vulnerable and helpless. D David has no transition there. He goes from, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. That's my confidence. That's my conviction. But now, Lord, let me share a very painful, personal relevant need that I need to share with you. Notice in verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Hear, O Lord. He's asking God to hear his prayer. Be gracious to me and answer me. This is his need for God. He begins with his confidence in God. He moves to his need for God. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Be gracious to me and answer me. He's asking God to listen to his prayer, to answer his request. He says, you have said, seek my face. He's reminding God of God's covenant with him, and he's saying to God, my heart is doing what you have told me to do. I am seeking your face, O Lord. What's he doing? He's echoing back to God what God has called him to do as a basis for pleading with, God's, with, with God to listen to him. Notice verse 9. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Now, if, if one danger of the Christian life is that we live uh, basically in a continual state of, of asking of God and never declaring of God, <laughs> of asking him for help and never declaring that he's worthy of our help, another danger is that we begin to treat the grace of God as almost a, a, an assumed presumption rather than a, an, an expression of constant dependence. Here's what I mean by that. David is not unwilling to declare to the Lord his ongoing need for God's grace. David doesn't think of God's grace towards him as something that he was given once and he no longer needs. Now, he's sure that God will give it again. He'll get to that. He's not doubting God's willingness to give grace He's just acknowledging that the same grace he received before is the grace he continues to need. 
Do you notice that? He, he's, he's praying with an acknowledgement that these requests are, are requests he's not even worthy to ask. He's going to ask God for help from people that are slandering him as we get to verse 11 and 12. But before he even asks that, he's acknowledging, Lord, I need you to be gracious with these requests. I need you to not turn me away in anger. Listen, it, it doesn't dishonor the Lord to acknowledge that we are not basing these requests on our own worthiness. It honors God's grace to acknowledge that we have no basis in ourselves for asking for his help. We're asking for him, Lord, I need you to overlook my impure motives and sinful life as I bring this request to you. That's a good thing for a Christian to do. Lord, I acknowledge that I am not worthy and the only reason you would answer me is because of your grace. The only reason you would listen to me is because of your mercy. I'm not asking you because I'm worthy. I'm asking you because you are gracious. I'm not asking you because I have nothing in me that could cause you to turn away from me. I'm asking you because your mercy is my only hope. Very different from the Christian who comes to God and declares with confidence that God owes him something. Or that uses their faith as a way of obligating God to act. No, David comes with a humility and says, Look, Lord, please don't turn your face away from me. It's my only hope. Don't reject me in anger. This is all I have, Lord. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. And you can feel almost the personal sense of loneliness in verse 10, for my father and my mother have forsaken me. Now, now we don't know of a situation where David's father and mother literally forsook him. Maybe this is metaphorical for the people of Israel. We don't know. There were certainly times when many of God's people had turned away from David. Maybe there was a time when literally his father and his mother had had forsaken him in some way. But he's basically saying, look, even in the moment when my dearest and closest relations, those you would surely assume would not forsake me, even in that moment, even in the moment where, where they have turned away from me, even in that moment, I have, I have one place I can surely go that he will not turn me out. The Lord will take me in. Listen, hope in the Lord is revealed when we honestly acknowledge our need for God's mercy. A life of faith, a life of hope in the Lord is not a life of perpetual emotional confidence. Sometimes it has moments of profound vulnerable need. David feels profoundly vulnerable even making this request to the Lord. And I I bet every one of us has felt that way. We're aware of our sin, we're aware of unworthiness, we're aware of what a terrible week we had. We're aware of how difficult we were with the children last week, and now we need God to answer a prayer, and we are reluctant to draw near to him because we are aware of how unworthy we are to even ask. Have you ever had that experience? I had that experience. You come to sing to the Lord and present your petitions to the Lord, but immediately you're aware, look, I have no reason to approach you with this. David models for us what real hope looks like. It doesn't look like perpetual faith and confidence. It doesn't look like ending in verse 6. As if the only kind of people that can ask anything of the Lord are the people who live in a perpetual state of verses 1 through 6. If you've been living absolutely confident with no fear and absolute peace all week long, then feel free to bring your request to the Lord. Well, no, who who feels that way? We should express confidence. We should express our hope in the Lord with declarations of praise. But we should also be able to say, Lord, forsake me not. I need your grace. Answer me. I'm not presumptuous of you. I'm not assuming that you owe me something. I'm laying claim to your own mercy. Even if my closest and dearest have forsaken me, the Lord will take me in. Which is good news, by the way, for anybody whose family has abandoned them. Whether it's children turning away from their parents, or parents who have disowned their children, whether it's relatives who dislike you because you follow Jesus, whether it's moral standards that you've stood on that have estranged you from dear ones, that verse is a gift to us. Even if father and mother 
were to forsake me, the Lord, the Lord will take me in. You notice his desperation doesn't go to despair. You notice the difference there? He is desperate. He is aware of his unworthiness. He's not dismissive or flippant about his sin, but he doesn't go to despair. I'm so unworthy, the Lord will not take me in. He's saying, I'm unworthy. Please don't turn away from me. Don't forsake me. And because of who you are, I am confident that you will take me in. And taking me in, here's what I need from you, O Lord. I'm not coming to you just for forgiveness. I'm also coming to you for direction. Teach me your way, O Lord. I need you to guide me on a level path. David has no appreciation or understanding of a kind of gospel of God that wants forgiveness and is disinterested in God himself. He has, he has, David would consider that ridiculous. David, for David, to come to the Lord is to come to him both for forgiveness and direction. It's to come to him both in need and in humble dependence on his authority. He's saying, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because I have enemies all around me and I need to know the right way to go. Then the specific request comes into play. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. Four, false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. He acknowledges he's not worthy. He acknowledges he needs God to be gracious to him. He says, I need you to guide me. I'm not saying just just preserve and protect the way that I want to go, regardless of how it honors you, regardless of, of what you think. No, I want you to show me. I want to follow you. And I need that because, Lord, I'm surrounded by those who are lying about me. I'm surrounded by those who are claiming falsely against me to my ruin. They want to destroy me. They breathe out violence. They're not just violent. They are slandering me, and in their slander, they want my downfall. Brothers and sisters, this is increasingly the Christian life in this age. This will be your experience, not chiefly because it was David's experience, but because there was someone else who lived this psalm to perfection. Jesus Christ was always, actually always confident in the Lord, never actually needed grace to cover his sin, and yet also was surrounded by those who slandered him because he stood in our place. And because of Jesus, and because we are in Christ, because we are identified with Christ, it is our expectation that in this life we will also face the slander of this world. As Jesus said, a servant is not above his master. If they did these things to me, they will do these things to you. So Christians, what do you do when you are faced with slander? Well, Psalm 27 is a great way to start. Declare confidence that the Lord is your refuge. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Even if I was surrounded by enemies, digital or physical. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Help me, O Lord. I'm not confident in myself. I'm not confident in my righteousness. I'm asking you to not forsake me. I'm laying claim on your mercy. And because you are merciful, I know you will take me in, even if the dearest and closest have turned away from me. And now, Lord, my request, show me the way to go, because false witnesses have risen against me. Listen, this psalm works in every century. This psalm works in every century. Every century there's people looking to devour. Every century there's Christians feeling as though someone wants to eat up my flesh. Every lifetime there's people who can say, answer me, O God. False witnesses have risen against me. And they breathe out violence. Listen, brothers and sisters, we are called to set our hope on the Lord. That looks like confidence in God. It also looks like bringing our need before the Lord, declaring to him our absolute need of his deliverance, his protection, his guidance. 
That this is what David is modeling for us. And remarkably, David is modeling this with far less information about God than we have. We've made this point again and again in the Psalms. It's, it's helpful if you read the Psalms simultaneously to remember that Jesus was both the perfect man and the perfect revelation of God. He was God and man at the same time. As man, he lived Psalm 27 in perfect faith surrounded by enemies. As God, as the revelation of God, he is the ultimate picture of God's merciful, protective faithfulness towards people who place all of their trust in him. Think about Psalm 27 and the greater revelation we have in Jesus. Now, David could say, the Lord is my light and salvation. Perhaps he was remembering Moses and his deliverance from the deliverance of the people from Egypt and how the Lord went before them in a pillar of fire, He's saying, the Lord, like that, you're my light in dark places. Maybe he's remembering how the Lord was their refuge in the wilderness and he watched over them. He could say, Lord, Lord, you are that for me. I believe that to be true of me. In the same way you answered Moses, I believe you are going to answer me. In the same way they were surrounded by enemies, I believe that when I am surrounded, I can turn to you in faith. But, but brothers and sisters, we have even more evidence of what God is like. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the light of the world. The name Jesus means or stands for the salvation of Yahweh. So there's this sense even in verse 1 where we can see the face of our Lord shining out from this passage. Who is our light in our salvation? It's the light of the world, Jesus himself. Who is the stronghold of our life? It's the one who sheltered us from the wrath of God by dying in our place. Who is the one who walked in the place of sinners surrounded by evildoers and facing their ultimate judgment because he was walking in our rightful place as sinners so that we could receive the grace and kindness of God toward us. Jesus. David can say, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. We can say that Yahweh has revealed himself in Jesus. Jesus is my light and my salvation. I've asked to be near him because he is my shelter. And in him, my head shall be lifted up around all my enemies. Hear, Lord Jesus, when I cry aloud. And we know that God will not turn us away in anger because Jesus absorbed all of the anger of God in our place so that we can draw near to God with confidence and make our requests to a merciful and gracious high priest who knows everything we went through, especially and including the slander of enemies. In Jesus, we have every reason to place our hope in the Lord, confidence in him, and also need for him, and finally, anticipation of him. Notice verse 13 and 14, David concludes, I believe. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. I believe this is an exhortation both to his own soul and to the reader. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. This psalm ends apparently without an answer to his specific request. It leaves David still surrounded by false witnesses that feel perhaps like wolves seeking to devour him. It leaves him in that place. We have no testimony in this psalm of how God practically rescued him. We just find him waiting, but waiting in hope. Waiting confident in God's ability to rescue having presented his request to a gracious God and now waiting in faith. I shall look upon the Lord in the land of the living. Brothers and sisters, don't we have many moments like this? We've expressed confidence in the Lord. We've requested God's deliverance and where are we right now? We're waiting. We're waiting. 
It's not a passive indifference. It's not a fatalism. It's a waiting full of faith. It's a way of saying, I, I, have, I have done, Lord, my part and declared my confidence in you. I have declared to you my need, my absolute dependence on your grace. I have presented my request before you, and now I am waiting. I am waiting. I am anticipating you. I like that word anticipate because it's, it's like the word waiting, uh, the way it should be rightly understood. It's, it's not waiting uh, with a kind of a cynical attitude. Well, we'll see what God does. It's anticipating. It's, it's, it's looking forward to what God is going to do. He is anticipating God. He is anticipating seeing God in the land of the living. He is anticipating that God will not finally abandon him to death. He will finally bring him into a place where he will see his God, the one he has hoped in. And when we come to the New Testament, again, that wonderful final phrase, it has even more relevance to us because we are waiting for the same thing. We are anticipating God in the same way. We may wait temporarily for some deliverance that God provides in this life, or we may wait permanently for a deliverance that we don't see until he raises us up from the grave and points our eyeballs right at him. But we are waiting. We are waiting for the Lord. Look, we are not called to demand in this life that it look like heaven on earth. We are called to ask the Lord to do mighty and miraculous things, always acknowledging that his timing is perfect and our faith is set on a future day when he will vindicate himself and his people. We are waiting. We are waiting full of hope. We are waiting full of faith. We are anticipating. So David says, be strong and let your heart take courage and wait. The Christian soldier anticipates the final action of his God regardless of how outnumbered he or she is. The Christian soldier anticipates the final action of his God without reference or concern, without how outnumbered he or she is. What does hope and faith look like? Well, it looks like confident declarations of God's salvation, his provision, his light, his refuge. And for some of us, we need to grow in declaring that the Lord is worthy of our trust. I'm not talking about believing that's the right thing to do. I'm saying actually doing it. I'm encouraging you this week in your prayer time, prayer time, spend some time actually declaring that the Lord is your light and salvation, that you do trust him. There's many things that we would not deny that we don't actually do. For others of us, it's good to bring our needs to the Lord, to declare our need for his grace, to request that God be merciful to us, to acknowledge that we need a fresh expression of his mercy because of our sin, and not to have a kind of flippant presumption of God as we walk through life without reference to our ongoing need for him to not forsake us. For many of us, we have a season right now where we're called to wait. We're all waiting for something that looks like heaven that isn't present in earth right now. Hope looks like waiting. And David says, be strong. And I think if he was in the New Testament era, he could say, oh, you have great reason to be strong. Be strong. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith, and wait. Wait. Be strong. And let your heart take courage and wait on the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us to be a church full of faith and hope. Lord, help us to be not those who give in to despair, who hold on to low-grade fears of what might happen. Help us to be those, Lord, that are not flippant towards your grace, but are continually declaring our dependence on it. 
Lord, help us to be those that wait. Lord, I want to pray, Lord, for those who Lord, have been facing an accusation recently. Or maybe it's an accusation of a family member that, Lord, it's just perennial. It comes up every holiday season. Lord, it's seen in the glances and the glares. Maybe it's seen in distance and silence, no phone calls. It's an accusation. Lord, and despite the best attempts at reconciliation, Lord, it still seems to linger. I pray, Lord, that you would give their heart courage to wait. Help them to wait on you. Lord, let this Thanksgiving be a season where we declare our songs of thankfulness with joy, with shouts of joy, because you are our light and our salvation. And Lord, where necessary, help, help members of our church, Lord, to wait for that final day, the great feast to come. And there will be no more waiting, only seeing and feasting. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.